What's up, Internet? It is that time of year once again, the time where we look to the future of next year by reminiscing about this year and thinking about all the good games that we played. So here we are with my top 10 favorite games of 2017. The 10 absolute best games that I got a hold of this year. Now, like always, I've got a few special mentions for games that couldn't quite make the list, mainly because I couldn't record them. This time we've got three, all PC games. So shoutouts to Noi2 Love 2 Devolution, available on Steam for dirt cheap. It's a great little game that's basically, what if Treasure made a mouse-based PC game? It's an absolute blast to play and it's real affordable. Cat Poke, a game as completely uncomplicated as that sounds. And finally, Lawnmower 2, The Return of Lawnmower, the PC freeware sequel to an NES homebrew game you didn't know you wanted, but you absolutely need to play. And the nice thing is, Lawnmower 2 is completely free, so I'll put a link in the description for that, as well as Catpoke being available on a pay-what-you-want basis. Well, yeah, I suppose that does technically mean you could pay nothing. Speaking as someone who's trying to make a living off fan donations, don't be that guy. No one likes that guy. Anyway, on to the actual list, kicking it off with number 10, Near Automatopoeia. A game that earns its number 10 spot, both because it's a damn fun little action beat-em-up RPG type thing, as well as some real kick-ass shmuff segments, but it also doesn't get any further down the list because I actually picked it up at the start of the month and I actually haven't played very much of it. But I was impressed with what I saw, and genuinely, the story as far as I've played thus far has kept me guessing quite a lot. I mean, thus far it's made me feel like it's kind of like the anti-Undertale, making me kill things I don't want to, and then making me feel horrible about it. So, thanks, game. But if nothing else, it is miles ahead better than the original Nier. It's a giant open world that's damn stylish, got a great soundtrack, and it's just fun. Seriously, this one, pretty worthwhile. I'm glad I picked it up, even though I didn't get into it until, like, the dead end of the year. Let's move on to number 9, where we continue the theme of PS4 games I picked up with Horizon Zero Dawn. This game had me intrigued out of the gate. You have a sort of post-apocalyptic future past sort of scenario with a very strong female lead, and genuinely, it's a really interesting game about figuring out who you are, figuring out what happens, and just trying to find your place in the world as well as taming a bunch of giant robot animals and killing tribes of other people. It's a damn good game, but it does have some issues. First and foremost being it gets real bloody repetitive. If you like stealth, well, congratulations, you're going to be sneaking around a bunch of bushes of, like, red leaves because that's the only thing that constitutes stealth in this game. A lot of the weapons feel basically the same. The armor really doesn't feel like it does anything of value with the exception of, like, the final armor you get. And unfortunately, this game does commit the cardinal sin of having giant gun T-Rexes and the ability to hack and ride robot animals, and yet somehow not having the ability to hack and ride giant gun T-Rexes. I mean, you can hack them, but you can't ride them. And let's just be honest, if I was on the dev team, page one, line one of the design document, Rideable, hackable, giant gun T-Rexes. How do you miss that? But the game itself is pretty good, and it does feel like it's creating a giant, interesting open world that could be expanded upon. They absolutely need to work on those mechanics because it does get a little repetitive, but I'm still pretty glad I played it. It's a damn fun game. Number 8. Man, I have played an absolute ton of Metarot this year. It started with me wanting to try and get the only English Metabots game that really tried to capture the spirit of the entire series, Metabots, but I ended up starting with the original Japanese Metarot, mainly because it was cheap, and since then I almost have a complete collection of region-free Metarot games. But because I've played so much, it puts me in an awkward spot, because I have to pick one. And as it stands, it's either got to be Metabots Rakusho, the game that made me really want to start playing these games, and the only English Metabots RPG out there, or Metarot 5, a Game Boy Color game that came out after, does more, and better, but is entirely Japanese. On one hand, English 
on the other better... Well, honestly, it's no real competition. I have to give it two. And the reason is quite simple. These games are all a lot of fun. I mean, they're unbalanced as all hell, but I find them to be a ton of fun. But the thing is, while one of these games is in English, it's also just a remake of the second game out there, so it's nowhere near as advanced and doesn't do half as much. But also, more importantly, going back to me starting on the original Metarot, even without being able to read a lick of Japanese, I was able to get through that RPG with absolutely no issue whatsoever. These games are really incredibly easy to get through and really accessible. Well, maybe not so much in terms of combat mechanics, that takes a little bit of figuring out, but in terms of actual progression, easy to get through, so the fact that one of them is in English compared to the other really doesn't matter all that much, especially when the other just does everything so much better. Keeping up the theme of kick-ass robot import games, we have number seven, Gundam Breaker 3, Break Edition. Mobile Suit Gundam? More like Mobile Suit Fundum, am I right? This game is the sequel to Gundam Breaker 2, a game that I'm quite fond of, and I find it quite ironic that in a game that's supposed to basically be about Japanese model kits that you'd always want to avoid the Chinese knockoff of, it's the Chinese version that's the preferable version of the game because, first of all, it's entirely in English. So at least you can appreciate the story and you can get around reading all the little bits of stats on your own custom Gundam. But secondly, it has all the DLC pre-installed on the disc, ready to be played, with no extra hassle, no extra downloading, nothing. So basically, you're getting a Game of the Year edition of a badass Japanese Gundam game, completely in English. And in my experience, it's actually cheaper than trying to buy the actual Japanese version. So you're getting more for less and better, and easily more accessible. That said, if you've been following me, you know this isn't as high as Gundam Breaker 2 was last year, and the reason is threefold. First, this game didn't eat up half as much of my life as Gundam Breaker 2 did. I spent six months of last year playing Gundam Breaker 2. This year, I've only sunk a couple hours in, but that's mostly because I've been bogged down with work on the channel, but hopefully that'll change in the near future because there's not a lot of games on the horizon I want to play. But secondly, this game does not feel as big a jump as Gundam Breaker 1 was to Gundam Breaker 2. And the difference between Gundam Breaker 1 to 2, not only did they refine the mechanics, as this game does, but they also added a ridiculous number of new mobile suits that you could customize and add to your own custom machine. Which really meant that if you had a favorite out there, chances are it was in here. But from Gundam Breaker 2 to Gundam Breaker 3, well, they added something like 20. And sure, there are SD Gundams in here, except that's a colossal cock tease because you can't play as any of them, not that I really have any interest in it, but for those that like SD Gundams, they're out of luck, they're just support AIs, which sucks. You added the Barbatos? Wow. Well, it's nice that you're embracing that Iron-Blooded Orphans was popular when this game came out, but, uh... Did you add an Iron-Blooded Orphan suit that wasn't as completely overrated as its pilot? No? Then come back when you bring the Grimgear. And thirdly, it just kind of felt like double dipping to have Gundam Breaker on back-to-back -back Game of the Year lists, so I just wasn't gonna put it as high. But, um, yeah. Moving on to number six, the result of probably the single most awkward phone call of my life, and a deal that ended up with me spending money on a lot of games with a fair percentage of me not receiving them, I got the one thing I wanted out of it, which was Drakengard 2. Now, I've been told a lot about the Drakengard series, that I really wanted to play it, and, I mean, with Nier being popular and being like the sequel to Drakengard, it was kind of important that I eventually get to play it. And, you know, it's damn good. I mean, it kind of sort of feels like a Dynasty Warriors game, and I absolutely frickin' hate those games. But this game is genuinely awesome. You're flying around on a dragon, burning people to ash, hopping off, taking your sword to them, it's surprising how fluid and well it works. And while it does kinda sorta of feel like a mindless action game, it feels like there's some actual weight and power to your actual attacks, not like the aforementioned Dynasty Warriors where it feels like you're just cutting through people made out of wet newspaper. This game impressed me, and I really, really have got to find the first Drakengard because I hear it's even better. But you know what? I'm impressed, Drakengard. Next up, number five. Phantom Crash. Man, 
the original Xbox had some really kick-ass mech games. And this is absolutely one of them. I got this game for like a dollar, and I do not regret it. You customize your own mech, drop them in an arena, and just wreak havoc. Until you either leave, or get blown up yourself. And it's a fast, fluid, frantic amount of just insane fun. If you like arcadey mech games, then this one is definitely one for you. I would not miss out on this. And, well, sure, the actual, like, visual customization of your machine is limited, and there's only, like, three levels, and one of them's kind of crappy, this game is absolutely worthwhile. Just for running around, cloaking your mech, shooting up other mechs, fighting boss mechs, this game is all about the action, and it does it incredibly well. And you've got a fair number of different weapons and tactics to employ with your mech. Seriously, if you like arcade mech action, this one is a no-brainer. Damn if I'm not impressed, Phantom Crash. And you're making me really love that I picked up an Xbox this year. Now we're in the top four. Let's get serious. Check this awesome game out. Painter Momopi. Okay, this is one of five import Game Boy games I got completely obsessed with this year. In fact, when I first saw this, it was in like a two-second clip of a video that had no labeling as to what this game was. So once I saw that, I immediately headed off to like this full list of every Game Boy game ever made to just try and figure out what this game was. And while this game is ridiculously hard to find and pretty insanely expensive, I don't regret it because it is a damn fun game. Sure, the pessimistic cynic in me could just as easily say, well, it's basically just a Pac-Man clone, but you know what? It's more than that. It's a game where you play as a friendly witch riding around on a push broom not named Kiki as you try and clean up the floors of this giant castle, fighting off ghosts using your magic spells and trying to earn rewards from the king. Man, I just love this game. Seriously, this game has very quickly jumped up the list of my favorite Game Boy games of all time. This game is damn fun. And... I think it's just a classic, it's just a damn shame that's hard to find and really isn't as easily accessible by everyone else simply because of its rarity. That said, Painter Momo P is an absolute treat to play, and if you can find a way to play it on your Game Boy, you absolutely should. Let's carry on to number 3, Persona 5. Kinda weird they dropped the whole, you know, series title in favor of just the simpler Persona 5, but uh... Alright, as the title would indicate, this is the newest iteration of everyone's favorite dating sim slash demon alternate personality mental psychic whatever fighting game, and it's a badass RPG all the same. I mean, first of all, this game gets bonus points for not being half as bad as Persona 4. I mean, that game was the most, like, tonally bipolar thing I've ever played. This one's got a damn cool theme of thieves trying to take back essentially the moral decency of the world and trying to right the world in their own way. And I dig that. What I don't dig is the fact that they kind of sort of make it seem kind of like a stealth game when it very much isn't. But other than that, it checks all the boxes for me. It's got the personas that you all know and love, even though the really iconic ones are DLC and you gotta pay extra for it. Not that I'm bitter about that. It's got the dating sim aspects that we all know and love. It's got a fairly well-written, well-paced story with actually genuinely interesting characters, Persona 4, and it just refines the combat down to a razor-sharp point. Is this game as good as my personal favorite in the series, Persona 3? Well, in terms of gameplay, absolutely. In terms of story, not a chance. But it's a damn good second best, and I'm quite happy I got to play it. Also, badass soundtrack. Any game that can make me listen to the same song on loop for a full day gets my full approval from a soundtrack perspective. Also, just shoutouts to Life Will Change. It's an awesome song. Let's keep this theme of PS4 games going with number two, Wild Guns Reloaded. What's that? You're taking one of the coolest Super Nintendo games, remaking it, adding a bunch of stuff, and making it cheaper than the original? You had me at your remaking one of the coolest Super Nintendo games ever and adding more stuff to it. And the nice thing is, unlike stupid remakes, it doesn't really change anything. It just adds more. I think that's what a good remake does, because when you change too much, well, the people who like the previous thing are going to hate it, and if you change too little, well, people will wonder why bother. But the fact is, it's easier to acquire than the original, it's cheaper than the original, and it has more than the original, with extra characters and stuff. Granted, I still want the original Super Nintendo version, but I think this one can tide me over for a while yet. 
Especially because this game is still really brutally hard. So here it is. It's time for the big show with number one. Let's party! Man, the original Xbox had some really kick-ass mech games. Huh, deja vu. Anyway, Metal Wolf Chaos! Who here didn't see this coming? I'm pretty sure everyone did because this game is just amazingly badass. First of all, it's insanely quotable. It's a giant action cheese fest. And, I mean, come on. You're running around as the Mecca President of the United States, blowing up your entire country, mowing down your countrymen for the sake of your burning hot Japanese American justice and saying the stupidest lines ever. The only problem is this game is ridiculously rare, ridiculously expensive, and is a Japanese Xbox exclusive. <laughs> so most of the people who could probably really appreciate how much this game is trying to just take jabs at America will never get to play it. And it's sad because everyone absolutely needs to get this because it is basically the best Xbox game ever made. Custom mechs running around blowing stuff up, saying incredibly cheesy quotable action lines, and just having a dumb fun time. Come on. This game is an absolute no-brainer, and it's an absolute must-own. If you have any way to get Metal Wolf Chaos, you need it in your life because, well, honestly, this game is basically life-changing. <laughs> Whether or not that's a good thing, well, I'll leave that up to you to decide, but, uh, this game is just amazing. Like, there are not enough words in the English language to describe this game. It is definitely one-of-a-kind and a must-own. And that is my top 10 games of 2017. But you know what? That's not where the fun ends, because you've got to tell me what yours are. Because I'm sure there are tons of games that came out this year, tons of games you played that I've never even heard of, that I absolutely need to know about. And that's what the amazing power of the comments section is for. So go use it and tell me what your best games of this year were. Because I absolutely need to add them to my list, so I can play them for next year. Anyway, that has been the best games of 2017. I hope you enjoyed it. And here's to your best games of 2017, helping my best games list of 2018 get better. Peace out, Internet.